It's truly wonderful to see everyone this morning. Before I begin my lesson, I want to encourage all the men who can of this congregation to attend our preacher's meeting. It's not just for preachers, it's for all the men. We will be discussing a very important issue tomorrow morning around noon, and that is going to be the new heaven, new earth issue that is infiltrating the church today. So I encourage you to be there. Uh, I think we might be able to have some good discussion and learn a few things about this. Now in our scripture reading this morning, I think this is a very good illustration about how men can take ideas and practices and turn them into a religious ritual without divine authority. For many people in the community, whenever they hear the word Christmas, they think of Christ's birth, and they observe it as a holy day. We often hear phrases like, Jesus is the reason for the season. Keep Christ in Christmas, things like that. When you're out there and you're enjoying the Christmas decorations this time of year, oftentimes as you drive by, you will see in some people's yards, and this is especially true in South Texas, a manger scene all lit up in the yard. And if you have the radio on, oftentimes you hear songs like Silent Night, O Little Town of Bethlehem, uh, Joy to the World, other religious songs that's dealing with the birth of Christ throughout this holiday season. Preachers began preaching Christmas sermons talking about the birth of Christ this time of year. And congregations will be singing the religious songs like we just mentioned and worship during this time of year. And yes, sad to say, even many churches of Christ are now jumping on that bandwagon. So the question is, is it okay to observe Christmas as a religious holy day? Or what about simply a national holiday with no religious connotation to it? For those who look upon it as Christ's birthday, is that okay? Is it wrong? Or is it right? Does putting up Christmas decorations and a Christmas tree along with the exchanging of gifts automatically associate you with a birthday crowd? What is the origin of Christmas? And what does the Bible say about it? These are some questions I hope to answer in my lesson this morning. This was a lesson that was requested of me, and I think it's a very good idea that we haven't been preaching on it very much. And just like whenever we thought that we defeated the mechanical instruments of music issue many years ago on the polemic platform, we quit preaching about it. And guess what? That issue came back to bite us, and it bit us hard. Same thing can happen with this very issue concerning celebrating Christmas. I do want to mention that uh, HD wrote a very good article. He loaned it to me and gave it to me, let me look through it in preparation for this lesson, but I made a copy of it and it's on the back table there in the foyer. I encourage you to pick it up and take it home. I made quite a few copies of it, but it's a very good article and I hope that you read it. What I want to begin with in my lesson this morning is talking about the origin of Christmas. History records for us that the celebration of Christ's birth actually began in the second century AD. Uh, It happened under the reign of the Roman Emperor Commodus who died around 180 AD. We also find out during the reign of Diocletian, he reigned from 284 to 305 AD, that a group of Christians had gathered together to celebrate the birth of Christ in the city of Nicomedia. Diocletian was nowhere close to a friend of Christianity, and he despised these people doing these very things to give honor to Christ in this way, so he ordered the doors of that house where they were meeting to be locked and sealed, and he set fire to the building, killing all who were inside. So it wasn't really long after the apostles had died that people began to to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. But the date of the celebration varied all throughout the year, depending upon the group who was doing the celebration. Now the date of the celebration of Jesus' birth wasn't really settled until about the end of the 4th century, early 5th century A.D. Prior to that time, it was celebrated by the Eastern Church, which is now known as the Greek Orthodox Church, on January the 6th to celebrate the Festival of Epiphany. 
And this is supposedly the day that the wise men visited the Christ child. Some celebrated Jesus' birth as late as April and May. Some have made a case for the date of his birth to be somewhere between mid-September or mid-March. And they base this upon Zacharias, who was of the course of Abiah, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. He was a priest. He was the father of John the baptizer. And according to when he served in the temple, and it was at that time when he was serving that the angel came to him and said he was going to have a son born. So we base that time according to the birth of John, and we can determine pretty close maybe the birth of Christ. Again, that takes us to about middle of September or the middle of March, depending upon which course he was serving in. Now, whenever the official discussion of setting the date began, dates were proposed for almost every month of the year. That tells me no one really knew the exact time of the, or date of Christ's birth. Finally, around A.D. 354, the Catholic Bishop Liberius suggested the date to be December the 25th. Now, he didn't set this day because it had any special signification, but what was happening here is the Catholic Church was having troubles with their parishioners celebrating a pagan holiday called Saturnalia, and it was celebrating the god Saturn. He was the mythological god of agriculture. This festival was instituted by the decree of Augustus Caesar, and it was celebrated from December the 17th through December the 23rd. So to prevent losing church members to this pagan celebration, the Catholic Church decided to take December the 25th to use it to celebrate the birth of Christ as a substitute celebration. But the Eastern Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, continued to vie for January the 6th. Well, the Western Church, which was, which was the Roman Catholic Church, was the more prominent of the two, more influential, and the date for December the 25th was set in 394 A.D. But the Feast of the Epiphany was set on January the 6th in order to appease the Eastern Church. And most of you all know that the Catholic Church has always been, still is, a master of compromise to be able to keep peace between two or more parties. Now, there are 12 days between December the 25th and January the 5th. Thus, people have come up with the 12 days of Christmas. These 12 days are followed by the Feast of Epiphany. And though the date for celebrating <coughs> Christ's birth and was set in A.D. 394, the term Christmas never really came around until the 11th century A.D., many years later. The word Christmas is clearly Catholic. It simply means the Mass of Christ. But, as we have seen, the celebration of Christ's birth predated even the origination of the Catholic Church, which uh, some say is 590 A.D., by more than 400 years. So the celebration of Christ's birth did not begin with the Catholics. It began way before that. But the name, Christmas, and the date, December the 25th, were set by the Catholics. Now, here's the big question. What does the Bible say about all of this? In one word, we can explain. It says nothing concerning the celebration of Christ's birth. There are only two accounts in the Bible concerning the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's found in Matthew chapters 1 and 2 and Luke chapters 1 through 3. These passages here tell us of Jesus' ancestry. There we have the genealogies. We are told about the conception of Mary by the Holy Spirit, the place and the circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth. And both genealogies trace Jesus' physical heritage all the way back to David, all the way back to Abraham, and yes, even all the way back to Adam. He was born of a virgin who was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, verifying that he was the very Son of God. He was the Son of the living God. He is the God-man. He was born of a manger in that town of Bethlehem, visited by angels and by shepherds. 
Now, think about this. He was also visited by wise men, but not at the manger. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, we're told that Mary and Joseph were already in a house when the wise men finally came. So whenever you see these manger scenes and you have the three wise men there, I think somebody needs to study their Bible just a little bit more. There are also confirmations of the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the birth of Jesus Christ in these accounts. But there is absolutely no evidence concerning the exact date of the birth of Christ found in these accounts. There is certainly no indication that it even took place around December the 25th. In fact, all of the circumstances that surround the shepherds and the, the wise men, they actually suggest a different time of the year. Now, in Palestine, December is right in the middle of the rainy season. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible speaks of shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their, over their flock by night. Now, I want to read something by an authority who was of no insignificant standing. In other words, people revere him. And he says this, and I quote, In the dry summer season, the hills were well nigh bare, affording insufficient pastures, so the shepherds then normally keep their sheep near the town and enfold them at night. But when the winter rains fall, the hills become clothed with, with grass, and the shepherds, knowing this, take their sheep further afield. Then, because it would make the sheep walk too far to reach the folds every evening, expending energy needlessly, they simply watch their flocks in the fields all night. A lot of people try to use what this man says, and they try to say, okay, see, there were shepherds watching their flocks at night in the field. But what he is actually saying is, they went farther into the hills. That's where the grass was now good and, and lush. And it was too far for them to come back into town because there would be too much driving of the animals. So during this time, the shepherds would be in the hills, hills not in the fields near the town. And I want you to notice in Luke chapter 2, verse 15, it says that all of the shepherds, they got together and they talked about the announcement that the angels made to them, and they all went to see the Christ child. They apparently left all of their sheep in the field unattended, something they certainly would not have done in the remote hills where predators abound. Now, others claim that the shepherds did not graze their flocks in the wintertime, abiding in the field, but kept them in sheepfolds, and they, they fed them with provender that they had gathered during the growing season. A.T. Robertson, in his book, A Harmony of the Gospels, said this. He said, the shepherds would hardly be in the fields at night with the flocks, which were usually taken into the folds in November and kept in till March. Now, this is something that I have heard more than once since I have become a Christian. Uh, the problem is, is every time I try to read up where do they get this information from, there is no substantial evidence to support it. This is just something that somebody apparently came up with, and it has continually been propagated. Again, I don't see any evidence for that, but whatever way you want to believe, neither scenario points to Christ's birth being anywhere close to December the 25th. Either they were too far away into the hills to be able to drive their sheep into town to be able to see the Christ child, or they weren't abiding in the fields at all with the sheep, but the sheep were in the sheepfolds and they were in town. But here's something else scripture says, and this talks about the wise men, and they tell how they were to seek the Christ child. And they said, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Again, this may not be absolute proof of when Jesus was born, but it certainly does not give any idea that this is a cloudy, rainy season when Jesus was born. Again, pointing to some other time of the year. But I think the most absolute proof that we have is that there is no reference to the early church ever celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ until after the death of the apostles around 150 A.D. 
All of the commandments given to the church by the apostles that were given to us, there is absolutely no indication that Christians were ever to celebrate the birth of Christ. The observance of Christmas as a religious holiday was not sanctioned by the apostles. In fact, they were guided into all truth by the Holy Spirit, John 16, verse 13. And observing Christmas in this fashion, therefore, because it's never mentioned, is without divine authority, and it is not according to truth. Again, it's not even possible to determine what month or what day Jesus was ever born in. But also remember this. The Old Testament was written for our learning, for our admonition, and for our example. Romans 15, verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. And with every religious holy day or festival, the people were told in what time they were supposed to do it, what day, what part of the year, and in what manner they were to observe these things. That was so in the patriarchal dispensation because we learn there in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 4 when Cain and Abel brought their worship to God. We're told in Genesis chapter 4 verses 3 and 5 that On a certain day, it tells me there was a designated day that they were to come. Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock, but Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Now, God had respect unto Abel's offering, but he didn't unto Cain's. And we're told why in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Abel offered his by faith. And we know that faith comes by hearing God's word. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. So instructions were given, not just as when, but how. This is also true in the Mosaic dispensation. There in Leviticus chapter 23, we have specific instructions concerning the feast days, like the Sabbath, the Passover, the Pentecost, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of the Tabernacles. And God has never left religious activities that he's commanded that he desired the people to observe to be left to their own choosing as to the when and the how. The same is also true even in the Christian dispensation. We're told specifically in John 4.24 that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. In other words, according to truth, according to instructions. And we're told when. We're told when we are to observe the Lord's Supper, one of the acts of worship, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. It's to be done on the first day of the week. We're told when we are to give of our means, the giving of the contribution. It's to also be done on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. So we're told when we are supposed to do these. We're told how we're to do these. We observe the Lord's death in the supper. We do it through the emblems. We observe the, or remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ through the emblems of the Lord's Supper. So all these things are given to us by instruction. Now the supposition that the observation and celebration of of Christmas as Christ's birth is a good thing certainly does not come from God. Uh, this This idea is purely humanistic. It comes from man, not from God. If we are to observe Christ's birth, then where does the Bible say it? We're not even given any instructions. Where are the instructions as to the how? Where are the indications as to the when? Where's the example that's given to us when the first century Christians ever observed the birth of Christ? As I said before, Jesus is not our Savior through his birth, but he is our Savior through his death and his subsequent resurrection. Now, I want you to consider something that the Bible talks of. First of all, celebrating Christmas as Christ's birth is not a matter of godliness because we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, verse 3. And yet, such a holy day is never mentioned in the Bible. Celebrating Christ's birth as, as, uh, or Christmas as Christ's birth is also not a matter of faith. As we said before, faith comes by hearing God's word, Romans 10, verse 17. And such celebration is never found in the Word of God. Celebrating Christmas as Christ's birth is not going to be something that will make us perfect because we're made perfect through the instructions of the inspired scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17. And they say nothing about this celebration. 
Now, you may think that you might give him honor by celebrating his birth, because we do that today with one another. We think that we honor people when we celebrate their birthday. <clears throat> but in reality, when you add to God's word by doing this, you dishonor him. You don't give him honor. Now, we believe that everything concerning the life of Christ is certainly noteworthy. But only one event in Christ's life that Christians are commanded to observe, and that is his death. Again, this remembrance is to be done on the first day of the week in the Lord's Supper. We're told when to do it, Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week. We're told how to do it, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, remembering his death, his body, and his blood through the emblems. Why haven't we been told anything like this concerning his birth and how to observe it? You know, the scriptures are to be our only guide in religious matters. <clears throat> in fact, Jesus taught that we are to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded us, Matthew 28, verse 20. And also, we're told to do all things, whether in dirt, word or in deed, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Colossians 3, verse 17. In other words, to be done by his authority. And we haven't been given any authority to do this in celebrating Christ's birth. John said, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son, 2 John, verse 9. And also Paul warned Christians not to think above that which is written, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. To celebrate Christ's birth on December the 25th or any day would violate all of these scriptures. Brethren, we need to abandon the mindset of, of the world when it comes to religious matters, and we need to adopt the mindset of Christ. Do as Christ said, without addition, subtraction, or substitution. So one other question. Is it okay to celebrate Christmas as a national holiday? You know, while some today do regard Christmas as a holy day, others consider it nothing more than just a national holiday, and there's no religious connotations given to it whatsoever. For many, it's just an occasion to be with family that maybe you haven't seen for a while, Maybe it's time to just kind of kick back, kick back and relax and enjoy some family time. We enjoy the festivities of the season. We have family dinners. We have exchanging of gifts. In fact, my wife and I raised both of our girls that we don't have any religious connotation to the time of Christmas. And it has not harmed them at all. In fact, we still enjoy this celebration with joy and happiness. We just need to refrain from using symbols that associate the holiday with unauthorized religious things, like having manger scenes or angels during this time, because to do so identifies us with vain worship, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, Matthew 15, verse 9. Now, those who say that if we celebrate Christmas, in any way perpetuates the errors of its origin. I think that lacks a lot of merit when they say that. And I say this because the word Christmas no longer conveys its elusive or its exclusive earlier meaning, but is just a national holiday for most people. Many who are not even Christians observe Christmas. In fact, the majority of the Taiwanese people, they practice a combination of Buddhism and Taoism, often with a Confucian worldview. And I visited Taiwan way back during December, I think it was close to the year 1992, and I remember looking around and there were Christmas decorations in every storefront and almost every street corner. So even Buddhists observe Christmas but they don't observe it as the birthday of Jesus Christ. But secondly, if we condemn Christmas for its original meaning, then there's also things that we have to refrain from that also are named from pagan background. For example, our days of the week, Sunday, 
derives its name from the sacred day of the sun, Monday from the sacred day of the moon. Wednesday is a celebration of Woden, who is a, an idle mythological creature. Uh, Thursday, celebrated as Thor's day, the mythological god of war. Saturday, celebration of Saturn, the mythological god of agriculture. To us, the days of the week just, you know, they bear no resemblance to the earlier usage. Uh, we use them in harmony of the way they mean for us today and not according to their original meaning. In the same manner, the term Christmas no longer means mass for Christ for most people. It's just a national holiday in which we can come together as family to enjoy one another's company. And likewise, many of the items that we use in our celebration for Christmas, like the tree, the mistletoe, the lights, uh, the exchanging of gifts, all come from pagan backgrounds but they don't have that same meaning for us today. Just like words oftentimes change their meaning over time, so do traditions and customs do the same thing. Today, we look at how things are used as they relate to our cultural connotations today, but not to its ancient history. This is how we observe it today. We don't think about the ancient history and what it meant way back then. It's changed. So I would encourage you to enjoy the holidays and celebrate, but just refrain from putting any type of religious connotation to it whatsoever, because we don't have authority to do that. It is not to be a religious holy day. It's just a national holiday. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He came not just to be born, but he came in human flesh. And the reason for that is so that he could be the proper example to us and that he could die a, his death for us and shed his blood that we might have remission of sins. And if you haven't applied the blood of Jesus Christ through obedience to the gospel, your sins are still with you. Jesus came so that he might save this world. He came to seek and to save that which is lost, Luke 19, verse 10. He came to give his life a ransom for many, Matthew 20, verse 28. He came for a purpose, and that was to die for you and me. But there's something we have to do to apply the blood, and that is in the act of baptism, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We're buried with him by baptism into death, because that's where he shed his blood. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do so. Otherwise, Jesus is coming to this world would have been for naught for you. If there's anything that we can help you with, whatever it is, that you might be able to have new life in you through obedience to the gospel, or if you are a child of God and you've strayed away from the pathway of duty and you've fallen back into the ways of the world, whatever it may be, we encourage you to repent of that. If you need further study, we would love to sit down and open up the scriptures with you and to study from what God has said. And if there's anybody here that needs to respond in any way, shape, form, or fashion, please respond while together we stand and sing.